Okay. Praise, glory, and honor be to the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. There's none else. There's no God with him. That's what he says. He says, there is no God with me. In other words, there's no other God that is on his level. He's greater than all. He is the source of all life, somehow or another. We have no idea how that could be, that he could be so far ahead of, of his, of all other beings. We just do not know. But that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, people don't want to teach that. People def definitely, definitely do not want to teach that. They want to teach a triad a triad of gods, a, a tri-god who has, he's got three heads. He's got multiple personalities. He's got just manifestations. He's, you know, the Hindu god has multiple manifestations. You know, they just think that certain people appear and they're just a manifestation of God and then another one is manifestation can't figure out Hinduism anyway. It's too... If you try to figure it out, try to find the book, there is no one authoritative book in Hinduism that tells you the absolute facts about God. And if you read any of those books, they make no sense. They say, you know, come on, tell me something. <laughs> so... Here we are at the fourth part in Hebrews. Talk about the false doctrine in Hebrews. There's a lot of it. I have, uh, I'm on the fourth page. I have 10 pages of, of verses that I used. Uh, I'm going to include an end screen. That's what they call those things at the end that pop up end screen of a message I did. I just edited it, made it a lot more concise. It was way too long. Uh, got rid of all the extra words, uh, unneeded statements. And uh, I talk a lot about the two accounts, the one in uh, Hebrews about um, Abraham and Melchizedek, and then compare the one in uh, Genesis. I'm going to talk about Melchizedek again, but I don't want to be repetitious on that. So here we are at Hebrews 5, 6 through 14. And as he says, also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And like I've said, we don't know who Melchizedek is. We have no idea. There's no biblical information about Melchizedek. So I don't, I don't recognize him. I don't acknowledge him as anybody, basically. We know that, all we know is that he was the king of Salem. And we don't even know anything more than that. So I don't even acknowledge him as anybody. And it says, uh, who in the days of his flesh, now he's talking about Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, well, we, we have no record of that. There's no verse that says that Jesus was bawling his eyes out and weeping uncontrollably. No, there's nothing. There's no verse. Uh, to him that was able to save him from death. And then it says, it was, and was heard in that he feared. So in other words, if he didn't fear, he wouldn't be heard. Well, that's not right. 
So he was in fear, plus, well, mostly because, first of all, we have no scripture that says that he was crying, uh, uh, strong crying. So that's false already. So the rest of it can't be true either. The rest of it really doesn't mean anything. It was heard and that he feared doesn't mean anything. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. No. So that's trying to say that he wasn't obedient. Jesus wasn't obedient until he suffered some things. It's trying to say that he wasn't obedient before his ministry. And I don't believe that. And he was obedient always, actually. Because he was the lamb without blemish and spot. So he had to be obedient. So that's just not true to say that he was he became obedient because he suffered. And then being made perfect, he became the author of it. Oh, so it's, and then it's saying that he was made perfect by his suffering. Now, he's made perfect because he was perfect. He was eternal. He was incarnated. And the body was prepared by God. And he was an eternal being. In reality, he had all knowledge when he was born. But we don't have any account of that. And we, we can't do an interview with Jesus at this point about that experience. If I could do an interview with Jesus, I'd ask him, uh, were you conscious Uh, conscious of your eternal existence and did you have the mind of a mature being when you were one day year old one day old because if he if he was an eternal being that was incarnated in the body of a baby then he would have the consciousness of an eternal being. But we don't know. Uh, then it says, He became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Which really, we're obeying God. Because everything that Jesus said was the word of God. And really, God is the author of eternal salvation. And Jesus was his messenger, his, his instrument to accomplish that. He was, Jesus was his mediator. He was many things. He was his sacrifice to end all the offerings that were given through Moses. It says, called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. There it is again, after the order of the unknown person we know nothing about, Melchizedek. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. I don't like this kind of talk. Even Jesus said that too. You know, there are many things to say to you, but you can't bear them at this time. Well, say them anyway. If they can't bear them, too bad. Life is is uh, is tough, you know. And if they don't understand them, then they'll just not understand them. So what? So what? We wanna we wanna be given knowledge. We wanna be given information. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Well, tell them anyway. You know, some may hear. Dull of hearing because they have no knowledge. They have no information. That's why they're dull and boring. For when for the time, let me move this up a little bit, number 12. For when for the time you are to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again 
which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Okay, so tell us, what are the first principles? And it says, And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Okay, so he's not telling us. He's not telling us what those principles are. And then he goes on saying the same thing. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. No, they just haven't been reading. They have no access to the word of righteousness. They're not using milk. Well, that's nonsense. It says, for he is a babe. He's a babe because he hasn't read the book. That's all. He hasn't memorized it. Because you can read a book. If you don't remember it, it's, what good is it? You have to remember what you read. And it goes on to say, for, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Strong meat? What are you talking about? There's the same amount of amino acids in milk as there is in meat. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Well, you, you discern good and evil by the reading the book, by memorizing the Ten Commandments. And the commandments of Moses and the commandments of Jesus are good. So, it's not like your senses are exercised. You just memorize what the book says. If you have to spend time memorizing it, you then do it. You know, because you can read it, and if you don't retain it, it's of no use. So I don't know what he's saying about milk and meat. It meat makes no sense, really. It's just a matter of. And then, of course, he's not telling you what. He's not telling you what those first principles of the oracles of God are. He's not even telling you. He claims that you'll be, you won't be able to hear. Well, especially if he doesn't tell you, you will definitely, you definitely won't be able to hear. So that's not right. So then we have Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. And this is an amazing thing. I've always thought this was amazing. Uh, amazingly false. It's like this in all the versions, too. This is not, you know, this is the King James, but it's just about the same in all the versions. And I, I find that really amazing because it's so not for Christ. It's so against Christ. Because listen to what this says. And I've heard a preacher preach on this and as if it was something else. Because you wouldn't actually read it and describe it in the words that it's saying because listen to what it says. It says, therefore, leaving the principles Okay, they're talking about leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. That's what he's saying. And then he's saying, let us go on to perfection, as if the principles of the doctrine of Christ are not perfection. Well, no. It's like antichrist. It's like anti-Bible these verses and then it's saying not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works yes yeah, so don't do any don't repent it's saying don't repent from your dead works and then it's saying don't lay the foundation of faith to a god anymore you, you, it says you're leaving those principles you're moving on well, that's what unbelievers are doing. That's what the other religions believe. That's what the New Age believes. And 
And, it says, and then it goes on to detail. What, you know, so you can't say, oh, he didn't know, uh, he didn't tell us what he was talking about. No, he's telling us. It says, of the doctrine of baptism. So get rid of that. No baptism in the in the spirit, no baptism no baptism in water, just get rid of it. Don't lay any more of those foundations. Don't, you know, move on from that. Move on to a bigger and better things. And they say, of the laying out of hands. Yeah, don't lay hands on people and try to get them healed. Don't do it. Well, that's not right. It says, and of, re of the resurrection... Well, it doesn't say in of the, but I'm saying it. In of the resurrection of the dead. In other words, don't try to raise anybody from the dead. They're no good anyway. You know, we, we're better off without them around. It says in of eternal judgment. Yeah, don't preach on eternal judgment. Get away from that doctrine. Move on to a, a new doctrine to uh, perfection. He said, let us go on to perfection. Well, what's that? Certainly not going to tell you. I don't know where this came from because this is what this says. This is what it says. This is what it has said from the time it was written because every version says this. No version that I know of. I could look closer. There might be one that does something to it, but I, I mean, how many versions do I have to look at? And so then he says, and this will we do. So all the things he just said, he says, this will we do. Move on to perfection. Leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ and go on to perfection if God permits. So supposedly God is going to commit you so supposedly God is going to permit you to move on from the doctrine of Christ to perfection and that's ridiculous. And that's just ridiculous. So then move on to Hebrews 7. A lot of things about Melchizedek in here. I'm, I'm trying to breeze through this because I just went over all that stuff when I edited the message. It's uh, number nine of uh, corrupt Bible translations. That's the end screen. That's the message on Melchizedek. I start out with some other verses, but then I get right into that. But it's... Bible translations number nine. Uh, Hebrews seven eleven through nineteen. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? and not be called after the order of Aaron. Well, the, the, the need was to get rid of all the offerings, the need for all those offerings. I heard uh, Netanyahu say in, in a message recently after the war started, and he says, Moses, our leader, he said that, Moses, our leader. And I said, what? They don't practice any of the, of the laws of Moses. They don't have all the offerings. They don't do the offerings. They don't have a, you know, a, a holy place where God actually manifests himself, uh, a temple or a tent or anywhere. They could if they really believed. So that's just hogwash. He's just trying to get help. He's trying to get help from the world to get money to fight the war. I think they already got enough money to do that. We already give them a tremendous amount of money. Now they're going to give them more money. 
which is we don't even have the money to give to begin with. <laughs> so the further need was, to, like I say, to get rid of all these offerings that needed to be done. That was the need, but it didn't. You don't change the law because then it says twelve. It says for the priesthood being changed, the need it was made of necessary. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. No, no change to the law. Well, the law of sacrifice, yeah, the law of of offerings. That part of the law, yeah. But they never tell you that, though. But the the the, the general law. Notice there was no talk of the offerings in the Ten Commandments. That's the law. The offerings were to appease the law. The offerings are not the law. The offerings were to provide a way to appease the law, to satisfy the law. Verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. That makes no sense. That's, that doesn't make any sense. Then it says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, true, we believe that, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So what? <laughs> Let me move it up. 15. And, uh, that's not moving. 15. It is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek. Oh, right, right. We know all about Melchizedek. We don't know anything about Melchizedek. And, you know, listen to that message that I did, uh, number nine of Bible translations. Uh, I don't acknowledge Melchizedek as being anybody. He's nobody. If he was so important, they would have put his name, they would have told us about who he was and not told us nonsense about him, whatever little that they did say. Because then it goes on, verse 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Yeah, Jesus was made after the power of an endless life. For he testifies that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's more about him. For there is verily or truly, I'm going to change that word to truly here. I'm just not in the mood for verily. For there is truly a disannulling of the commandment going before. Which commandment? I used to preach this because it was all about uh, tithing, and so I was saying that you know the, the doctrine of tithing has been disannulled, which is true too. But and you know, these people are talking about disannulling the entire law, uh, going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. Well, no, it's. It's where it's at. It's 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 what it's all about. The law, you know. It's not weakness. It's strength. If you keep the law, then you're strong. It's if you keep the law, then it's profitable, highly profitable. If you don't keep the law, then it's unprofitable. Talking about the law, I'm not talking about the offerings. For the law made nothing perfect. Wrong. It made everybody perfect that kept it. made them holy. Uh, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Oh, I don't see that. They don't even teach it now. 
these people. It, it, the, the better hope that he's talking about is supposedly the gospel, their version of the gospel, yet they don't even preach any of the laws of God. Generally speaking, they do not. No, nobody does. It's a doctrine of just power and grace, the word is used, grace, that is given to people, and they just sit back and receive it, and they don't do anything. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Then we go to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, 8 through 13, and I'll finish up on these after I do these. But finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, so he's claiming God is finding fault, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. Well, here it's saying that he's going to put the laws of the old covenant, because those are the laws of God. See? He says he's going to put those laws in the minds of the people of Jesus of the new covenant. He doesn't do it automatically. You have to read them. That's why you don't ever hear anybody talking about them. And you don't see them keeping the laws necessarily, in many cases. Put my, put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Well, the Old Testament says you've got to put it in your mouth and in your heart. Then, then they'll be written. God doesn't automatically write them there. He says, I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. I really should say, and I will be to them God, and they shall be to me a people, because I will be to them a God. No, it's going to be the supreme God not just another God. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And I don't know where this came from. As if, you know, Jesus said, Go and teach all men to obey all that I have commanded you. Here it's saying, that somehow nobody is going to need to teach anybody and they'll just automatically know God. No, no, no. There's no such thing. No such thing. You've got to teach every man. That's what you have to do. So I don't know where in the world this, this came from. There's no such thing as this. That people just automatically are going to be perfect. It just makes no sense. It makes no sense. You have to teach people. There has to be a avenue for them to be taught. To receive it. To receive the information. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. And that last verse, that's not in the Old Testament. The mystery writer of Hebrews put that in there. Again, anti-law, saying that somehow the old covenant and the laws of 
that were given to Moses was going to some was decaying. No, no such thing, uh, because Jesus said that that the law would be fulfilled. One jot and, and one tittle would not uh, be removed from the law till all be fulfilled. Uh, He's saying it's, it's de decaying and it's becoming old. It's becoming old. Like it says in the book of Acts, you know, all that old religion with Moses and so forth. It's passe. It's gone. No such thing. The law is always there. The law is the law. It was given to Moses in clarity and it will always be in effect. God is going to judge people by the law. How else is he going to judge people? And then, on top of that, he says that it was going to vanish. Just poof, gone. Just totally vanish. So no wonder we have this doctrine in churches where they never teach that people should keep the law. Uh, the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments of right and wrong. They never teach it. Never. Levit Leviticus chapter 11 says, you, you shall not eat pigs. Do not eat pigs. That You'll be unclean. And if you don't eat pigs, then you will be clean. I mean, that's what it says. And completely been abolished in the New Testament as if it never was given, as if God was just dreaming or something. He was just, you know, temporarily confused and told them not to eat all these animals like snakes and bugs and so forth and there's a whole bunch of crazy animals that he said you shouldn't eat. But now people say, no problem, you can eat, eat them all if you want. Yeah, but that's why God killed all those pigs and he sent all those demon spirits into them and they all went down into the water and died as a, uh, as a sign, you know, that you, know, you shouldn't eat pigs. <laughs> I mean, wh what other reason, what other possible reason would be given what other possible reason is there for that? There's none. But it, it's so clear in that chapter. You shall not eat pigs. Leviticus chapter 11. If you eat pigs, that's, they're unclean to you. You shall not eat them. 